Welcome everyone to the Fight for Voting Rights with Mark Elias. My name is Bobby Saferstein, and as the Senior Director of Programming and Public Engagement for the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA, I want to thank you for joining us, both for today's program and also for joining together hand in hand in the crucial fight for voting rights. Over the last several years, voting rights and democracy in the United States have been under constant attack particularly by extremists that have taken over the GOP. Republicans at all levels of government have made it clear that undermining the right to vote and eroding the strength of American democracy is their primary objective and their surest path for staying in power. As Jewish Democrats, protecting democracy and preserving the right to vote are fundamental to our values. It was the number one issue for Jewish voters in the 2022 election and likely will be again in 2024. At the state level, Republicans have passed voter suppression laws that make it harder to vote, and they've gerrymandered congressional maps to lock in an anti-majoritarian congressional advantage. Republican attorneys general tried to overturn state level vote counts across the country in efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Donald Trump fueled the hatred and misinformation that led to the January 6th insurrection, and just minutes after the violent attack on our Capitol, 147 Republican members of Congress still voted to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Fortunately, Democrats have been fighting back, and we have no better champion than today's guest, Mark Elias, who has played a crucial role in so many of the voting rights victories we have witnessed over the last two decades. The country's leading voting rights attorney, Mark, is the founding partner of the Elias Law Group, He's represented both the Democratic National Committee and Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and has served as general counsel for former Secretaries of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton and Vice President Kamala Harris. In 2020, Mark led efforts to fight voter disenfranchisement cases in the lead up to the general election, and in its aftermath, stopped Donald Trump and his legal team's efforts to steal the election by winning a remarkable 64 out of the 65 bogus election lawsuits. And in 2021, Mark became the first recipient of JDCA's Ruth Bader Ginsburg Justice Award. From gerrymandering in Alabama to the Freedom to Vote Act and so much more, we have a tough fight ahead of us, and we're thankful to have Mark at the helm. Mark, thank you so much for joining us again this afternoon. We're Thanks. grateful for your allyship and support of JDCA. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start off by asking about Jewish values. And if you haven't seen JDCA's Seder plate of organizational values, we encourage you to do so by visiting the link in the chat. Chayrut, or freedom as a responsibility, is a central tenet of our tradition and a core value at JDCA. We know that the only way to actualize freedom for all is through democracy and free and fair elections. Mark, can you please tell us a bit about how your Jewish values drive and inform your work? to secure voting rights and free elections around the country? Right, so I'm really glad you asked because um, Judaism and the values that it has instilled in me is the driving force of much of the democracy work I do. You know, you mentioned Cheirut and it is sometimes loosely translated to mean freedom. But what it is, is it is the freedom to do what is right, right? There's a different concept in the, in the Old Testament, Chofesh, which is like freedom as like, do what you want, right? You want to go to the mall, you want to shop, you want to sleep in, you want to ignore injustice in the world. That's one kind of freedom. But the freedom that that the, that, um, the uh, Israelites were committed to at Mount Sinai was the freedom to do what's right. So when I look out at what we are seeing, what we have been seeing in the last decade, certainly since Donald Trump's emergence, is an effort to systematically disenfranchise voters. They are systematically disenfranchising Black voters, minority voters, young voters. And oftentimes the Jewish community, frankly, is not targeted by those, right? Like Jews tend to have pretty high um, rates of voter participation. We tend to live in more affluent uh, coastal communities in states that have more permissive voting rights. But it is our obligation every single day to do to ha to do what's right not to just turn a blind eye not to ignore 
the attacks on democracy, the attacks on freedom that we are seeing throughout this country. So that is a motivational force for me. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't add that, you know, Jewish history is is replete with examples of what happens when Jews don't don't stand up, right? When Jews think that the crisis will pass, the authoritarianism that is that we are seeing won't get that bad. And I'm not prepared to let that happen, you know, and I know I know you all aren't either. So I think speaking with moral clarity about what we are seeing right now on the other side of the aisle, among Republicans, where right now six co-conspirators who conspired with Donald Trump to undermine free and fair elections, we know that at least five of them were lawyers. It may be that all six of them were lawyers, but at least five of them were lawyers. And so we need to speak out and talk about the importance of voting rights and uh, fair, free and fair elections and not allow the, the other side's um, abandonment of those issues to take hold in this country. Thank you. We couldn't agree more and are grateful that you and everyone watching at home are in this fight with us together. Today's questions will be asked by members of JDCA's New Leaders Council, which is a group of young professionals, activists, and Jewish leaders from across the country. To ask our next question, I'm delighted to turn it over to JDCA New Leaders Council Vice Chair and JDCA Ohio Chapter Lead, Adam Rosen. Adam? Thanks, Bobby. Good to see you. Thanks for being with us, Mark. Uh, one of the biggest challenges Democrats faced in the 2022 elections were the effects of redistricting. Um, at the same time, Democrats in states like Michigan benefited from state ballot initiatives protecting access to abortion. Um, in Ohio, we're dealing with both. Um, our state Supreme Court throughout gerrymandered districts on several occasions, despite a ballot initiative to pass fair districts. And the state legislature repeatedly implemented unfair maps. Um, next week, we have a special election in Ohio that's been contrived by Republicans after they removed special elections in, in August uh, to make the rules harder for Ohioans to amend our state constitution and pass ballot initiatives, including one in November, uh, which will be on the ballot to ensure reproductive rights in Ohio. Can you speak to the impact of redistricting and ballot initiatives, including the one we're dealing with in Ohio on the next election? Yeah, so first of all, um, I, thanks for the question. It was my law firm that sued uh, to challenge the illegal um, maps, the maps that violate the state constitution in Ohio. For, for those of you counting at home, the state Supreme Court struck them down seven times. <laughs> so you said several times, it was seven. Uh, but the Republicans in the state are committed to continuing to um, to impose unconstitutional uh, gerrymandered maps. So the state Supreme Court was not willing to order its own map. It kept sending it back thinking that Frank LaRose and the Republicans would do the right thing. And of course, they did the wrong thing over and over and over again. There is now, as you point out, a, a ballot initiative uh, effort on the choice issue that will be on the ballot in um, uh, in November, um, again, my law firm brought the litigation to that is um, uh, that is defending that ballot initiative and uh, and and challenged the efforts to undermine it. Um, and and you know what we know is that a majority of Ohioans support a woman's right to choose, and the, yet the Republicans in the state are trying to first uh, thwart the ballot initiative by putting another ballot initiative uh, on the ballot that will be voted on on August 8th, which um, in case you're wondering why August 8th, they thought if they put it on the ballot in, in the middle of August, uh, young people wouldn't vote. Uh, I think they're going to be surprised by that, but it would actually raise the threshold to pass a ballot initiative from 50% to 60%. So that was their first effort. Now they're going to court saying that the November ballot initiative um, uh, is is somehow invalid, that's going to fail as well. So so the voters of Ohio are going to get their chance to, to amend the Constitution. But I think you raised the broader question, which is, why is the Republican Party so committed to restricting ballot initiatives? Why are they so committed to gerrymandering? And here's why. Because a majority of Americans don't support them or their policies. 
Like here is here is a stunning fact when you think about it. In 2024, the Republican Party is going to try to win the president of the United States by winning a minority of the popular vote. That is, for you, for you all, unfortunately, has become very typical. That is ahistoric. When George Bush became president in 2000 after losing the popular vote, that was a source of embarrassment. It was a source of, of, of political weakness for, for, for Bush in his first term. And in fact, when he ran in 2004, he told his campaign staff to campaign in California and New York precisely because he wanted to increase his popular vote because he didn't think it was right that a president should govern with, with losing the popular vote. By the time we get to 2020, Donald Trump's not trying to win the popular vote. By 2024, they are they have to... Um, uh, they are not trying to win the popular vote. They don't try to win the popular vote. If you look at the Senate overall, the House overall, state legislative chambers overall, governor's races overall, they are a minority party and they are increasingly deeper in the minority. So when you're in the minority, what do you, and you cannot appeal to a majoritarian impulse in the country, what do you do? You restrict the majoritarian impulse. You do it by restricting ballot initiatives, right? Which are ultimately majoritarian. You do it by uh, rigging the maps so that a majority of the electorate can't uh, express their will in the majority seats. And you do it by engaging in voter suppression and an election subversion. I mean, ultimately what Donald Trump did in the lead up to January 6th was ultimately caused by an anti-majoritarian impulse that has taken over the Republican Party. Voter suppression is an anti-majoritarian impulse. It is premised on the idea that if everyone who is eligible to vote was able to vote, they would do worse. And so that's what I think is going on in Ohio. That's what I think is going on nationally. And it's really important, you know, I know you're in Ohio, you know, that that people, Republicans will try to pass off people like Frank LaRose as a quote unquote moderate. He is an unapologetic a uh, uh, vote suppressor, an election rigger. And so we cannot allow our efforts to try to find common ground with our Republican friends and our Republican allies to overlook the fact that from top to bottom, the Republican Party is in on this. It is not a fringe part of their party. It is their party. Thanks, Mark. Uh... Thank you for your answer. I'm going to hand it over to Gabby Scherr, fellow NLC member, to ask the next question. Gabby? Thank you, Adam. And Mark, thanks so much for being with us. On a related note, one of the most highly anticipated cases on the Supreme Court docket this year was Moore v. Harper, where the Republican state legislature in North Carolina claimed their election laws were immune from judicial review. Thankfully, the Supreme Court ruled that this theory had no legal basis, and as a result, state courts retained the power to strike down unfair maps in many states. Did you expect this decision given the conservative majority on the court now? And what implications does this decision have both for North Carolina and the rest of the country? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, again, my law firm represented Harper in Moore v. Harper. Um, and, you know, I was, I, I, I'll say this, I was surprised at the sweep of the rejection of the of the fringe theory, but I was not surprised directionally. I mean, fundamentally, the independent state legislature theory was always a bumper sticker more than it was a legal doctrine. All right, it it because it it kind of proved too much. I mean, the the theory, for those of you who don't know, is that because the Constitution gives Congress the authorities at the time, place, and I'm sorry, state legislatures, rather, the authorities at the time, place, and manner of elections subject to congressional override. And by the way, the legislatures to set the uh, the time uh, uh, and the place, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the time and the manner of presidential electors. Um, the Because of that, what that means is that only state legislatures can do that, not state courts. And the problem with that theory that that somehow, therefore, what the legislature is an act is immune from state judicial review. The problem with that is it just proves too much. I mean, for example, what about governors? Does that mean that a legislate a state the legislature that passes an act that gets um, vetoed by the governor uh, is somehow still in force? Um, also, you know, as I pointed out several times, uh, why I thought we the Supreme Court would reject this. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court reviews an awful lot of statutes that say that Congress has the authority, right? So the independent state legislature ha doctrine has a 
has a analog at the federal level, which Marbury versus Madison <laughs> sort of like clarified out of existence, which is that the Supreme Court gets to interpret state, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, congressional acts that are committed to Congress. So I was surprised that it was rejected as, as widely as it was. I was also a little surprised that the Supreme Court actually just didn't moot the case because it, by the time it was decided, it was kind of a case about nothing. The uh, the new Ham the North Carolina Supreme Court had reversed its underlying decision, um, but uh, it was certainly welcome. And hopefully, what it means going forward is that this fringe theory is dead. But look, here's the thing: is the Federalist Society is chock a block with fringe theories. Like they've got a you know the, just this term, they decided a case under something called the Major's Question Major Questions Doctrine. That's not in the Constitution. Like that's just like literally another made up fringe theory by conservatives who don't want, who didn't want in that instance, President Biden to be able to forgive student loan, right? The statute clearly allowed him to do it. And the Supreme Court just decided that it was that they were going to create a new doctrine to not let him do it. So the threat of uh, the threat in courts are not over for um, for Democrats or for people who care about freedom and care about um, democracy. Um, but uh, certainly one of the dangerous possible lines of argument as we go into 2024 is it relates to voting rights seems to have been neutralized. That's fascinating. Thank you, Mark. For the next question, I'm delighted to hand it over to fellow JDCA NLC member, Brian Klein. Brian. Thank you, Gabby. And thanks, Mark, for being here. Uh, you're one of the country's most influential leaders in the fight for voting rights. You have taken on case after case to combat Republican voter suppression and unfair maps around the country. Here in Florida, where I live, Ron DeSantis and the Republicans in the legislature imposed one of the most gerrymandered maps in the country while passing a new restrictive election law in advance of the 2022 midterms. As long as Republicans in the Senate and now the House continue to oppose and block comprehensive voting rights legis legislation, these problems will persist. What will it take to pass meaningful voting rights legislation? Electing Democrats. You know, I've, I've had this, I've had this debate for now seemingly my entire career. <laughs> or at least it feels like my entire career, maybe it's just been the last, you know, five, 10 years. If you want to enact meaningful legislation in the House and Senate to protect the right to vote and democracy, make Hakeem Jeffries the speaker, Chuck Schumer the leader, and re-elect Joe Biden. Like that, that's it. Like the the magical hunt for the unicorn Republican it, it just is a waste of time. I mean, you know, they, they don't exist. When the Freedom to Vote Act and the John R. Lewis um, Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act, the three bills from last term, came before the U.S. House, every single Republican voted against it. So I want to do a thought exercise. There are like 200 of you on this. So I want all 200 of you to think right now, who is the most sensible, moderate Republican in the House or the most pro-democracy member of the House that you can think of? They voted against those bills. Okay, Lynn Cheney voted against those bills. Adam Kinzinger voted against those bills. Meyer or whatever the guy from Michigan is, he voted against those bills. Whoever it is that you think might be that moderating voice, they voted against each and every one of those bills. In the Senate, you know, there's a lot of talk about the filibuster. I thought we should have done away with the filibuster to pass voting rights legislation. A lot of people focus on a couple of Democrats there. Not a single Republican voted for those bills. Right. So so when you talk about what we need to do for legislation, we just need more Democrats because there are no Republicans who are going to support expanding or protecting um, the right to vote. I do want to say a quick word about Florida. Um, DeSantis uh, signed that bill 7055. We sued within an hour on behalf of the NAACP and others. We got an injunction against the worst parts of that bill from going into effect. Doesn't mean that the courts are going to save democracy in Florida or anyone else, but we're 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 really um, optimistic about our chance of blocking the worst parts of that bill. And we continue to litigate the the maps in Florida. You know, back to the Ohio question is, you know, Flor Floridians passed a constitutional amendment called the Fair District Amendments that would prohibit both partisan gerrymandering and also retrogression, basically treating uh, minority voters worse with new maps than last maps. And Ron DeSantis trampled all over that. And so we are continuing to litigate that as well. Thank you, and we're glad to have you in our corner. I'd now like to hand it over to NLCR Sydney Levin Epstein for the next question. Uh, 
Thank you, Brian. Um, last year, Congress passed bipartisan measure to amend the Electoral Count Act to make it harder for Republicans to overturn a presidential election. Are there similar items to improve our elections that Democrats can and should pursue with Republican support? So, I mean, you, the kicker there is that last phrase, with the Republican support. You know, I've listed a series of, of, of legislative um, acts that states can adopt. So I think there are things that Democratic governors and state legislatures can adopt. I, I'm, I'm kind of like out of ideas for how to get Republicans to vote for 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 basically anything. I, 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 I'm, I, I supported the Electoral Count Act. I think it was an important piece of legislation. Um, I think that it got better as the legislative process moved forward. Um, but, you know, I, I will point out that the Republicans signed on to it when, you know, Kamala Harris is the vice president. <laughs> so, so just like, you know, before we get too excited about what Republicans are up to. But in terms of like what what I think we need to do in, uh, in advance of 2024, I think there are some things, like I said, that Democrats can do. I, I think that the the single biggest threat to the 2024 election, I've been very outspoken about this, um, is vigilanteism by conservative and Republican organizations. You know, if you think about it, two years ago, four years ago, we talked a lot about voter purges, right? Voter purges is when the state removes people from the rolls. Well, what, what's happened is because Republicans have lost in court in their efforts to do voter purges, they now have vigilante organizations, non-state actors, file mass challenges. ProPublica Pro just did a big article on this in Georgia. I've written about this. And that Georgia, that happened in Georgia because, because the Republicans in Georgia made it easier to challenge voters and made it harder to defeat those challenges. So I think you're going to see more of that. So I think every I think every democratically controlled state ought to ought to ban voter challenges. There's no reason why private actors ought to be able to challenge your right to vote and certainly shouldn't be able to challenge the right to vote of someone they don't know personally. That's one thing. Second, you know, uh, uh, we're waiting on a bill in North Carolina right now. The Republicans are going to try to move that will allow partisan poll watchers to get within five feet of the voter while they vote. OK, this is just, again, a way to outsource to partisans voter intimidation at the polls. Every state ought to ban um, interference in the voting process. We saw last year um, in Arizona, uh, 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 armed militia people with video cameras and body armor uh, staking out drop boxes in Maricopa County, Arizona, and trying to intimidate people from dropping their ballots off, dropping their mail ballots off. Like, those are things we ought to be outlawing across the board. And so there are things like that that I think should be easy. They should be common sense. Republicans presumably shouldn't be against it, but but I don't count on it. And then finally, last thing I'll say is that most of the people on this call, um, uh, uh, you know, who vote in person, either themselves or they know someone who has waited in line to vote. And that's because the people who wait in line to vote are really typically either young, right? You see it in college campuses all the time, or minority voters. And Congress and or states should pass a, a law that says no voter should wait more than 30 minutes in line to vote. That was the that was the finding of a bipartisan commission several years ago. Everyone agrees that no one should have to wait more than 30 minutes in line to vote. States should codify that as a right of the voter. And if people are waiting more than 30 minutes in line, they should receive compensation for their time, just like you do at the airlines. Uh, and uh, the state, the counties that have those long lines should have to take remedial action immediately. Thank you, Mark. That was really helpful insight. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to JDCA and Elsier, an executive director of the Jewish Public Affairs Committee of California, David Bukarski. David? Thanks, Sydney. Um, and hi, Mark. Um, so you mentioned this, but just recently, Democrats reintroduced the Freedom to Vote Act, which for folks on the call, um, this bill is a comprehensive voting rights and democracy reform package that is aimed at um, tackling some of the most urgent issues facing our country. It takes on a huge number of issues and offers just as many solutions. Um, so can you share with us some of the most important problems the bill addresses? Yeah, look, the Freedom to Vote Act is a critical piece of legislation that would do several things. But the most important thing from my, from my vantage point is it sets minimum standards for every state. You know, it doesn't say that, you know, if California wants to do more, wants to provide more opportunities to vote or greater protections against gerrymandering, 
that's great, but it puts a floor under the minimum that states have to do. It guarantees that every state has to provide some amount of early voting. It guarantees the right to vote by mail. You know, people don't realize, but in states like Texas, there's no uh, right uh, uh, to have a, a vote by mail unless you're elderly or infirm. So, so we need we you know it it gives that as a minimum right. It puts in place minimum protections against par partisan gerrymander. You know, the scourge that we have seen in state after state. So. It puts in place these sort of minimum thresholds. It's not, it's ambitious in the sense that, you know, it puts in place minimum thresholds, but it's actually a very common sense bill. When you read it, you're kind of like, well, that doesn't seem like a big deal. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it seems like every, we ought to, we ought to have, you know, uh, a, a right to vote. We ought to have, you know, no gerrymandering. We ought to be providing um, everyone an opportunity to vote by mail. We ought to be making sure there are drop boxes. I mean, the the Republican war on on secure metal containers just shows how crazy they have become. I mean, like even I, who focus on Republican crazy, never would have envisioned that secure metal containers, like literally the difference between a mailbox and a drop box is a stamp. <laughs> like, you know, and by the way, the drop boxes are probably more secure because they don't then the ballots then go don't go through an entire postal system. But but it guarantees, you know, drop boxes. Um, so it's a very, very common sense bill, but it's essential because, you know, in, in 2013, the Republicans in North Carolina passed a bill that has famously got struck down. I was a part of that litigation, got struck down for targeting African Americans with near surgical precision. That's the quote that the court used. If Republicans were able to target Black voters with near surgical precision in 2013, what do you think they're doing in 2023? Right? Just think about how much how much more venal that party has become, how much more anti-democracy it's become, how much more willing it's it's it is to shout out loud its its anti-democratic um words. And also think about how much better the technology has gotten you know, computer technology in targeting particular subgroups. So we need the Freedom to Vote Act because Republican states have become worse and worse and worse on, on voting. And it is creating an environment where we're just, in some states, we're just on the precipice of like losing what anyone could describe as free and fair elections. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. And um, just as a, a little bit of a follow-up, I know you talked about um, some of the, the state legislative items that are happening that are really scary to hear about. And as someone who's based in, in California, I think we've done a lot of um, really good work on, mm -hmm. on, on, on voting access and voting rights. Can you talk about maybe some of the um, highlights that are happening in California that can be a model for other states? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I, I always get in trouble because someone inevitably asks me, what state is the state that everyone should be like? And I always say, First, every state is different, right? Different states are gonna have different cultures. In some states, there is a much stronger culture of vote by mail. You know, Colorado, uh, Washington, um, Oregon are entirely vote by mail states. There are other states that have more of a culture of in-person voting. Um, but for those people, there still ought to be vote by mail, right? So like, so I, you know, the first thing I wanna say is, is that, um, there is there is not a magic right. There is a minimum that everyone should do. And then there are what's right for them. California is certainly, if I had, when I am forced to pick a state that is the most right, <laughs> I oftentimes point to California because it, it, it does try to do the most things in giving voters optionality and meeting them where they are in what they, in, in in how they want to vote, how they want to engage in the process. So, um, uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is that I think that California is also a good model, but again, not alone in that it understands that even it can get better, right? So one of the things that I always say to Democrats when I talk to Democratic controlled states is there's no state that can't make their voting better. And you ought to always be curious about what you can do to improve it. Sometimes the improvements are gonna be big improvements. Sometimes they're just gonna be efficiency improvements. Sometimes they're gonna be making sure the drop boxes are, uh, that are located are 
are, are more centrally located or optimized, or the information you're putting out are in more languages. So I think like if I had to say one thing about California, it is that, is that it is, it is constantly optimizing itself to try to meet the challenges of a very, very large and diverse state. You know, it's not sort of settled in what it does. So it gives lots of options for vote by mail, obviously, lots of drop boxes, uh, uh, language proficiency. Um, it allows um, uh, third party um, uh, ballot collection so people who don't have access to mail can get their ballots. And there's, you know, there's, it allows, it has a, it has a rigorous cure process for people whose ballots are rejected so they can fix them. Like it's got a lot of the bells and whistles you would look for. Uh, it's got um, automatic voter registration, right? Like I could list and list and list, but but I think really what I praise California about is its curiosity in constantly iterating to say, you know what, our its attitude is not, you know what, we got it, we're perfect. Rather, it is constantly learning and evolving to make voting better. Really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, I'm now happy to pass things over to NLC -er and JDCA Director of, Out of Outreach, Partnerships, and Youth Voter Engagement, Eve Levinson. Eve, take it away. Thank you so much, David. And as a fellow Californian, appreciated that conversation uh, about how California is doing well, but also where we can always improve. Uh, so, Mark, thank you so much for being uh, with us here today. You recently wrote an opinion piece published in Democracy Docket called Republicans Want to Make It Harder to Vote and Easier to Cheat great title, where you explain uh, the GOP's strategy for voter suppression, and you focus there and you have elsewhere also specifically on Republicans' efforts to suppress young voters and specifically to voting on college campuses. Um, how can we, as a as a youth organizer myself, I really appreciate folks like you speaking out about this. Uh, my question for you today is how can we best educate, inform, and organize voters, particularly younger voters and students, despite the restrictive voting laws in some states? And also, can you share a little bit about the role uh, that Gen Z voters have played in past election cycles and are set to play in the upcoming cycle? Yeah, look, Republicans are terrified of young voters. I mean, they're just terrified of young voters because number one, there's so many of you. you know, Gen Z is a very large generational cohort. Um, so it's uh, it's a large generation. The second is small, relatively small changes in youth turnout can have dramatic impacts, right? It's not a population that is voting at, um, at the highest rates, right? Older voters still vote at higher rates than young voters. So there's just a lot more room for growth in terms of young voters. And then finally, you know, young voters are uh, are are progressive. They're they're overwhelmingly democratic. Uh they're progressive and oftentimes they are located in places that are highly significant to the outcome of elections. I mean, New Hampshire, uh it's something like 10% of the eligible population of voters in New Hampshire are on college campuses. You think about states like Michigan and Wisconsin, Florida, and just think about the large college populations in those states. So, so um, from a Republican standpoint, it is, it's a huge problem. And they've made a decision rather than trying to appeal to young voters, they're going to try to suppress young voters. And one of the problems that we have is that um, if you think about it, there are a lot of organized or there are a lot of organizations whose purpose is to protect different groups of voters, there are fewer organizations. I won't say there are none, but there are fewer organizations targeted specifically at protecting the rights of young voters. The, the, the 26th Amendment was put in place precisely to do that. You know, it was, it mirrors the 26th Amendment. People think what the 26th Amendment says is that 18 year olds get the right to vote. That isn't what it says. What it says is you cannot discriminate in voting based on age for anyone over 18. And there's a huge difference there because states routinely discriminate against young voters. And it's the kind of thing I always say to audiences, like just imagine you take what the Republicans are doing and take out the word college students and put in racial minorities. You take out the word young voters and you put in seniors <laughs> and you would automatically be struck at how outrageous some of the things they are doing are. I mean, we've obviously seen in in um, Ohio and in Idaho this year efforts to target um, uh, college voters um, uh, uh, specifically. 
Uh, but we've seen in state after state after state, the efforts to prevent college and universities, for example, from hosting polling locations. We had a sue, I had a sue last year, I had a sue Dutchess County, New York, in order to put a polling place on the college campus at Vassar. New York law required it. Like this wasn't optional. Like New York law requires a polling place on a college campus if they can. And Vassar wanted a polling place on college campus. So, you know, we 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 face this in Florida. There was an effort to ban college voting in on the University of Florida campus. Um, in Ohio, one of the worst provisions of the bill that they passed this year targets college students were, were suing over that. Um, but what we can do, I think what you all can do is to make sure college students understand and make sure the parents of college students and the grandparents of college students understand that discriminating against young voters is wrong. That may seem really simple, but sometimes I feel like there's just less ind indignation about the idea that a legislator is tar legislature is openly targeting college students or young voters. And we need to speak out loudly and clear, clearly that we had this debate as a country. The 26th Amendment was enacted. And, and the idea that Republicans now, in fact, there's a Republican presidential candidate running around trying to say he would repeal the 26th Amendment. Like this attack on young voters is immoral. It is wrong and it is illegal. And so I think we need to speak about it in much more assertive terms than I think we sometimes do. Thank you for that answer and for modeling how to speak about that uh, so assertively and the importance of also, I think, the intergenerational work when we're looking at getting out the youth vote, which is one of the reasons why I'm so proud and excited for JDC's expanded work uh, to be looking at how do we uh, both mobilize younger Jewish voters and also engage more younger uh, Jewish volunteers in our work to mobilize the Jewish vote. Uh, so looking forward to continuing to work in partnership with you on that. Uh, and now I'm thrilled to pass it back over to Bobby Saferstein, JDCA's Senior Director of Programming and Public Engagement. Thank you, Eve. Um, I also just wanted to take this moment to acknowledge and thank Eve, whose last day on staff with JDCA is today. As our outgoing Director of Outreach, Partnerships, and Youth Voter Engagement, we are grateful for all of Eve's contributions to our organization and are excited for you to continue being part of JDCA on our new Leaders Council, and we'll be cheering you on in all of your professional pursuits. So thank you very much, Eve. Now back to some audience questions. Um, Mark, we haven't really discussed yet the recent Supreme Court cases striking down Republican gerrymanders in Alabama and Louisiana, which surprised many of us pleasantly um, as the court upheld really one of the last parts of the Voting Rights Act. Why did the court rule in favor of voting rights in these cases? And what does that mean for all of us going forward? Yeah, great question. So my law firm represents uh, the plaintiffs in one of the two cases that went up. Uh, the, my partner, Abakana, argued the case in the Supreme Court in the Alabama case, and we represent the plaintiffs in the Louisiana case. I would add, just for everyone tracking at home, there's also a case in Georgia. It didn't go to the Supreme Court. Um, it has not yet been um, adjudicated through the trial court, but I, if I had to just like put my prognosticators hat on, we're going to have an additional um, um, uh, majority minority district in Alabama, Louisiana, and in Georgia. Texas, there's also a case going on. My law firm's involved in litigating that case a little bit further behind. But let me now address your, your, your question about um, uh, what the Supreme Court did. Look, I, I, I think that there are a lot of prognostications as to why the Supreme Court, in the end, in the two big voting cases, Morvey Harper and Allen versus Milligan, which is the Alabama case, why they ruled in our favor rather than against us. Um, I think in the uh, in the Moore v. Harper case, as I mentioned, I think it was in part because the theory was just kind of like not plausible. It like had attracted a lot of attention among conservative ideologues, but it just it doesn't hold together as a legal theory. I think in the in Allen, um, it's kind of the opposite, which is that Section Two of the Voting Rights Act, which is the provision you're talking about, had has been in place for a very long time, um, and it has predominantly been used in the area of of redistricting. 
And the test that the three judge panel had adopted in Alabama, the trial panel, was a test that was set up by the Supreme Court in the 1980s. The panel that struck down the Alabama map had two appointees by Donald Trump and one by Ronald Reagan. Like this was pretty much a very vanilla case of violating the Voting Rights Act. And so, you know, as I sometimes said to folks, if 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 Section Two of the Voting Rights Act doesn't protect Black voters in Alabama, like who does it protect, right? So, so in some respects, I think the Supreme Court was confronted with in Alabama. Are they going to just overturn another case? You know, are they going to use this as a case to, over, to once again overturn like decades and decades of precedent? Because there have been a lot of Section 2 cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. And remember, when they struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County, it was Chief Justice Roberts who wrote that opinion and, and reaffirmed that nothing in that opinion would undermine Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. So you know, I don't know whether they just, you know, stare decisis rule today, whether it's because the majority um, just felt like it was too much too fast. You know, after all, they were going to be doing a lot of other in the affirmative action, the student loan and the the, the Colorado um, uh, uh, website case. They're going to be doing a lot of other things to overturn precedent. But for whatever or whether they just thought it was right on the law. Um, they, but for whatever reason, they reaffirm Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and it's going to have a real impact for 2024. I'm very proud of what that is going to mean in practical term for minority voters um, in a number of key states. Thank you. Uh, to continue along those lines, in addition to, to traditional voter suppression, Republicans engaged in mass voter disinformation to cause confusion and undermine confidence in our elections. How do we prepare for the efforts in 2024 to overturn the results of the election? And can you describe further what steps are being taken and that we should take to fight disinformation in our elections? Yeah, I, look, I, one of the places, I, I think that there have been some real successes um, and some real challenges um, in, the, um, in the democracy space. I think the misinformation space has been particularly challenging. I mean, the amount of, of just absolute lies that get told about elections. There was just a poll this morning that I saw that CNN released that said 70% of Republicans believe Joe Biden didn't win the 2020 election. Just let that sink in. 70% of Republicans. You know, when you, when you look at, you know, in your daily lives, groups of people you know who are Republicans, seven in 10 of them believe that the, that the general election in 2020 was was um, the Joe Biden didn't win. So so the level of misinformation is not just a problem in the volume of it, but also that that the Republican Party has embraced it. Do you know what I mean? So like we used to do with misinformation that there'd be you know um, fake phone calls or something that would go out that would say election day has been moved, right? And that was a problem that you could tackle by saying, okay, we're going to find out who's doing it and stop them. Or we're going to, um, uh, or we're going to, um, uh, you know, we're going to put out correct information. The problem now is that the misinformation is actually sort of part and parcel of the Republican Party establishment. It is part and parcel of their appeal. I mean, it is part. Uh, misinformation is the central appeal that Donald Trump is making to voters in the Republican Party, and he is he is leading. So I, I'm at a loss, frankly, of what to do. I mean, we have a we have a dramatic uptick in anti-Semitism because there is, you know, the oldest hatred on earth is has a renaissance in these era, eras of tremendous misinformation. And I don't have the solution. You know, all I can say is that we just those of us who know the truth need to spread it. We need to insist on it. And we can't shy away from it. You know, this is the this is the challenge that your generation and all of us have been tasked with. It's not, it's not pleasant, um, but we cannot just hide from it. You know, I sometimes think that um, as Jews, sometimes we just think, you know what, it's easier to not make a fuss and just like ignore it, ignore the, the lies and misinformation. But I don't think we can do that. I think we have to confront it everywhere we can in private and in public. And uh, that's the best answer I have. 
Uh, thank you. I, I think that's, you know, one of our tenants also in core values of even if, you know, it's in the Talmud, even if we are not uh, able to complete the work, we must not abstain from trying and doing it ourselves. Um, so with that, what is the importance of the work of organizations like JDCA rooted in efforts to defend democracy? I think it's critically important. I think that JDCA has a unique role in democracy at this moment in history. Um, and there are two reasons for that. The first is because Jews have a unique obligation and a unique role. Um, you know, you asked me as my first question about how Judaism informed my values around this. I, I sometimes tell the story, and I've told this story uh, uh, in other settings, uh, in other uh, uh, meetings with you all, that when I was being um, bar mitzvahed, um, I was studying for my bar mitzvah, um, uh, by the way, Rabbi, Rabbi Saperstein, probably no relationship. Uh, well, it wouldn't be a relationship since you're a Saperstein. Yeah. But uh, Harold Saperstein, who was a, a famous rabbi in the Reformed Jewish community, was the was the rabbi. But he but they brought in a, a guy who had been a U.S. soldier. He had been a G.I., an American, but Jewish, who had fought in World War II. And he'd been captured by the Nazis. And he'd been put in a, um, um, in a Stalag. You know the 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 war camps uh, uh, for prisoners of war, and he and some of the other Jewish soldiers they were tasked with picking produce and sorting produce in their work camp, and he and some of the other Jewish soldiers got the idea that they would take little pieces of barbed wire from the fences around the camp, and they would poke holes in the produce. And you remember him saying they poked holes in the potatoes with the hope that it would rot the potatoes. And his theory was that that this would therefore starve the German war effort. The German soldiers would would go to eat their potatoes or their produce, and it would be rotten, and therefore they'd be hungry and they'd fight less effectively. So just imagine yourself: you're 19 years old or 20 years old, whatever he was, and you're literally in Nazi Germany as a Jewish soldier, pr prisoner of war, and you are every day against your bare fingers, without gloves, in the cold, in the heat pressing barbed wire, hoping that you're going to poke enough holes that you're going to deter the German war effort, okay? That is a unique obligation. I mean, first of all, it's like the most Jewish thing ever, right? If you think about it, right? Like it's the most, like, if you think about like how you how you would fight, you know, the Nazis, like it, it is, it shows the perseverance, um, you know, it is it is embodied in the story of, you know, Judah Maccabee and, and Hanukkah and, 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 you know, and Moses and the Israelites, right? It's like a very, it's a very, um, uh, it's very true to kind of who, who we are, but, but it is important that, that as a Jewish organization, we are doing everything we can, however effective or ineffective or partially effective as it is. We are trying. So that's number one. That's the first answer. The second answer is maybe a little less, um, uh, a little less um, uh, religious and more practical. But look, a lot of the people who are being discriminated against in these voting uh, rules, yes, they're young, but they're also black. They're Hispanic. Um, they are they are people who are being demonized and marginalized by the voting system because Republicans have chosen to demonize and marginalize them. And for the Jewish community that knows what that feels like, knows what it's like to be targeted um, as a minority community, um, it is important that we step up and say, look, Maybe I living in California or I living in New Jersey or in New York or in Washington, D.C., I don't face discrimination in my vote. But I'm not going to just turn a blind eye to the fact that others do. And frankly, we need more allies. Um, we need more white allies in this movement, more people who are who don't have the who are not facing the day to day discrimination. Uh, that is heaped on uh, people of color and young voters to, to call this out. And the Jewish community stands at an, at, an, at an essential place in that in that struggle. Thank you. I, I think we have time for two to three more questions. And so I just want to thank the audience for submitting them. And 
please continue to do so. While Democrats introduced the Freedom to Vote Act, Republicans advanced a bill that would do the opposite. Their bill, the American Competence in Elections Act, was described on Democracy Docket as the first national elections bill to root itself in the election conspiracy theories fostered by former President Donald Trump and the MAGA Republican Party over the last eight years. Can you explain some of the ways Republicans in Congress want to strip away voting rights and make it harder to vote in this legislation? Yeah, it's like it's like it's like voting out of the 1950s. It's actually a remarkable bill. Like it would actually roll back a whole bunch of things that like Republican states are doing. Like it would basically do away with no excuse uh, 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 absentee voting. You know, there you'd only be able to vote absentee if you were out of the county or out of the state or otherwise inability, uh, unable to go uh, in person. It would it would limit or completely abolish um, early voting. Um, uh, it uh, it would. Um, uh, do away with ballot drop boxes. Like it, it, it would essentially, if you just think of what the voting experience was for people in the 1950s, in person, short election days, in person only, hard to register, um, uh, uh, would be the standard. The reason why you saw me flick my hands is it actually wasn't that hard to register in the 50s. So in some ways it would be harder than it was in the 50s because in 50s it was actually relatively easy to register to vote and there was no voter ID. So it's kind of like the 50s meets uh, the, the, you know, the nonsense of voter ID and, and, um, uh, and, and making voter registration more difficult. But this is the vision that, uh, that Republicans have. You know, Republicans, they, they periodically engage in this propaganda that they that they um, you know the RNC announced now that you know they're they're going to try to mobilize people to vote by mail. Then why are the Republicans in Arizona suing Arizona to abolish vote by mail? Why are the Republicans in in Pennsylvania suing to prevent um, uh, Pennsylvanians from voting by mail? Now. They just lost that lawsuit in Arizona and Pennsylvania, so that's no longer a problem. But, you know, and Republicans lost the lawsuit in Illinois. They sued Illinois to make voting harder. They sued California to make voting harder. Like, so the truth is that they, their, they, their legislative proposal um, reflects where their party is on this, which is just making it much, much harder to vote and easier to cheat. Yes, indeed. So what are your thoughts on electoral and campaign finance reforms like ranked choice voting, public financing of elections? And do you see more states or localities embracing reforms like these? So look, I think that the, the um, I am for what's going to work. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I think that the, the question of ranked choice voting is one that needs to be sorted out at the look at the local and state level. Um, there are places that have deployed ranked choice voting that I think have been um, very happy with it. And they think it's been successful. There are other places where I think it has, it has been more challenging, both from an administration standpoint and from a voter education standpoint. So I'm not ready to say everyone needs ranked choice voting. I'm also not willing to say nobody needs ranked choice voting. I think there is a theory behind ranked choice voting that it will lead to more moderate candidates. Um, that's kind of the, the pro-democracy argument, I think, around it, is that it will ultimately lead to more moderating forces. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I think it ought to be given the Republican effort to ban it proactively in states, I think, is, is wrong. Um, why they are banning ranked choice voting at the state level. We ought to let cities and localities and some states uh, explore it and see what the results are, you know, see whether, in fact, it is yielding um, more pro-democracy results or not. Um, on the public funding front, you know, look, that is a struggle and a fight that's, that's, that is, uh, been going on since the Buckley case in the early 70s. Um, there are some places where public financing has worked, again, more at the, at the state and local level. It, it, there used to be a public funding system for presidential candidates, it's still on the books, but it is not really widely used. The, the thing I always say about campaign finance reform or the campaign finance um, uh, efforts is you have a Supreme Court 
that has embraced a maximalist version of money and politics. And it's very, very difficult to see meaningful campaign finance reform survive this Supreme Court. Now, there are some public financing proposals that do survive this Supreme Court. Um, but again, I think you're going to see those play out at the state and local level more than at the federal level, unless we get freedom to vote, right? If we get freedom to vote, then then the whole world becomes different in terms of what's possible. Um, but I don't see a public financing provision, a, a bill passing Republicans um, uh, at the federal level. Well, Mark, I want to thank you again for being with us today. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to do. And uh, we're just grateful to be in this fight alongside you for voting rights and protecting our democracy. Well, thank you. And thank everyone for joining today. And really thank the staff for committing themselves to living their Jewish values and democracy. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our NLC members for participating in today's conversation and to all of you at home for tuning in. This immense responsibility to protect democracy lies with each of us. It's up to us to live by our Jewish and democratic values, as Mark just said, to protect our democracy. And we're so grateful that you're doing so with JDCA. Next Monday, August 7th, please join the Jewish Democratic Women for Action's phone bank for the Ohio special election, which is crucial to protecting democracy and reproductive rights in Ohio. You can sign up to phone bank with Jidwa by following the link in the chat. As Jewish Democrats, it's critical that we turn out the vote. So please remember to vote no on ballot initiative one. Also, mark your calendars for Wednesday, September 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern and visit jewishdems.org backslash, uh, backslash events to sign up for a special program on the changing politics of gun safety. Presented by JDCA and the Giffords organization, we'll be joined by former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords and other leaders to discuss how the movement to end gun violence has matured to become more effective over the past 10 years. This is one conversation you don't wanna miss, so please make sure to sign up and attend. Finally, if you're not already on JDCA's email list, please visit jewishdems.org and sign up to stay current on our upcoming events and opportunities. While there, we hope you'll join one of JDCA's local chapters and affiliates made up of incredible grassroots volunteers. We also encourage you to support JDCA in programs like today's by making a financial contribution and by becoming a JDCA member to gain access to exclusive events and briefings throughout the year. We hope you found today's program meaningful and are as inspired as we are to work together in the fight for voting rights and so much more. Thank you again for joining us. Wishing you each of you an early Shabbat Shalom, and we'll see you again real soon. Take care.